Hello, everybody. My name is Jelani, and welcome to the 32nd episode of the DSI Rising series, put on by DSI World, where our goal here is always to provide an opportunity for many of the wonderful projects on our growing DSI World dashboard to just formally introduce themselves, update their progress, highlight their achievements, and just generally engage with both the DSI World and wider DSI community. Now, the idea behind all this is always that at DSI World, we're very much, we very much believe that more than the tech, more than the funding, it is the community leveraging these tools. That is essentially is what is gonna usher in many of the changes that we are looking for DSI to bring to the various legacy STEM industries. Now in today's episode, I have the ple pleasure of speaking with Kevin Wad, who you see up here on stage, who is the actual founder of Etica, which is a community driven blockchain that aims to fund open source medical research without the need for intellectual property. And this is actually really interesting um, uh, perspective. And so with that being said, welcome Kevin. And thank you for the time for taking the time today to help us learn more, not just about yourself, but also the extensive work being done at Etica. Hi, Johnny. Um, nice to be here. And uh, yeah, uh, I mean, uh, it's a very good pleasure, you know, and uh, I hope we can cover very well because there is a lot to say. Absolutely. I think I, I went through, I've been going through you guys' website and there's a lot going on there, a lot of really interesting um, initiatives and it's, it's like an ecosystem all into itself. It covers financing, uh, intellectual property, not so much as an actual patent, but the idea behind it, um, scientific discovery, innovation. I think there's a lot to really dive into. And I feel like Etica doesn't get the attention, as much attention as other projects in the space. And we're hopefully from this, we can kind of spin that up forward and get people to you know, engage and leverage these tools this very active tool that can be used to help further their funding or further their research. Um, so with that said, how about we start all the way back from the beginning and we kind of go into introduction. So, you know, Kevin, I'd love to hear what your parcours, what your trajectory has been that has led you to where you are now in the Web3 space. How did you get involved in Web3 and where did that start? Yeah, uh, so th first of all, you know, I think like, um, the very important point you know to understand about HK is that uh, it's a community driven project so the only thing you know I did is uh, make the the technical thing the code and then um, I published the white paper in back in 2019 and slowly you know people have, have seen the white paper and the community has started to grow so right now you know we don't have any companies there is no private company behind HK and it's completely open source and it's 100% um, community driven. So, I mean, my, my position is not very important because uh, the goal, you know, is to truly create a neutral protocol that is controlled by no one and that is completely censorship resistant. So uh, this is something very important to know about Etika. That's, that's a really good point because for those, of, for those individuals that exist in the space that are decentralized maxis, um, there are very few really decentralized protocols, whether it be in Web3, but especially in decentralized science. And that is partially because the criteria and the particularities of science require filtering layers, people who have experience in terms of judging and validating what proposals come through. Be that as it may, I think Etica, at least based off of what you just said, and I love how you extricate yourself as being, you know, I'm not, I'm just the creator of the code. The community has kind of taken it upon itself and it's Etica has become, you know, what it is from the, from the perspective of the, of the community. There are very few projects, if any, maybe a, one or two that exist in DSA that are like that. So that's, congratulations for setting that precedent forward. I mean, thank you, you know, but uh, yeah, this is the ethos of Etica. And I, I think, you know, when a community is building, you know, the, the first momentum, the first um, ethos of the community is very important. And it's, um, and then I think it, it's remains, you know, because for instance, I'm a very big supporter of Monero. And I also know that, uh, that uh, Monero was, was built this way. And today it's still something that is very profound within the community. So I hope that in the future, when Etika will grow and it will become much bigger, that this ethos was will mean, you know, that basically anyone in the community, when someone has an idea or someone, someone wants to take something in charge, you know, 
Uh, there is nothing uh, preventing it. There is no like uh, private entity. Everything is fully open, and this is the way we are organizing ourselves right now. Magnific. So decentralized minded from from inception, or I guess for the people from inception. It's a great thing. Um, but still, my first the you know the initial question is how did you get there? So what led to you creating the code base that would give rise to, to Etika? Yeah, for sure. So basically, I was involved in blockchain since uh, 2014. And uh, so first I was into the Bitcoin ecosystem. And then very rapidly, you know, I identified Ethereum technology. And so back in 2015, 2016, I was in the first uh, developers in France to, to, to uh, discover the um, Ethereum um, blockchain. So um, I've seen, you know, the first project that started on Ethereum. It was uh, like a Slack, um, uh, there was a, a DAO for trying to make a slow kit, uh, trying to make a kind of Airbnb decentralized. And um, so I, I tried, you know, very early to identify the potential use cases of blockchain and uh, for which industry it could be the, the best. And when I uh, had the idea you know, to, to, to implement a blockchain for this particular problem of intellectual property, it's like everything, you know, everything was very clear that it was something very important to do. It was the right thing to do. So back in 2018, uh, I started to work on this and I even uh, tried to get an appointment with some researchers at uh, Institut Pasteur in France back in 2018. And um, then I coded the, 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 the smart contract in 2019 and the white paper was published also in the Satoshi Nakamoto emailing list in 2019. And uh, yeah, this is basically you know, how we saw it. It's just uh, trying to connect um, with this particular issue. And um, yeah. Awesome. And so are you, are you a scientist by training? Are you, are, do you, does your background stem from the biomedical field in addition to computation? Yeah, I mean, I'm not a scientist. I'm not like, uh, I don't have a degree in science, but uh, I've always been interested in, in, in science. And when my 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 um, my, my school, you know, uh, I, I was into the scientific uh, uh, fields, so I have this experience of science. But I'm not like I didn't uh, uh, go into uh, like uh, making a degree in science. But I have this, you know, this uh, mind of curiosity and science, all of this. So right now, I think with the emergence of new technologies like AI and other technologies, I think we are going to see a lot of breakthrough into science. And it's also important to have a kind of a different viewpoint when it comes to science to, um, because I think right now, because science is not enough open source, so we, don't, we do not share enough ideas. And I, I do feel like um, the, the way we are doing science today is too much closed. So, they are not you know, inviting the ideas of people. And also, you know, I don't expect only scientists to go into HK because as I said, this is completely open source and open to everyone. So this is more like uh, the fact that there will be a variety of ideas and people that have never been exposed to this kind of problems as well, they can submit new ideas and new proposals. That's amazing. I think that that speaks very much to the ethos of DeSci, right? As somebody who is not, well, personally, I'm a scientist, but for yourself, as somebody who is not necessarily a former trained scientist, but coming in and seeing a problem in society, it could have been any other problem, um, but putting forth the initiative to actually build out a platform that addresses that and then allowing it to be, or building it in such a way, or leveraging decentralized tooling, which allows it to kind of take on a life of its own and evolve through community engagement. Um, yeah. that, in and of itself is D side, right? That's the whole premise behind D side. So exactly that people can come in, you know, not I imagine they can fork the code, but they can also propose internally to the direction. And I noticed as an example of this, Etika in the white paper talks a lot about biomedical implication, but I imagine that this, this tool case, this tool set is, is applicable to anything. So whether I be in anthropology or astrophysics or space, anybody can leverage this code base, this tooling to help fund um, their research proposals. I think what you, what you just said, you know, this is, 
this is very strong, you know, because uh, exactly, you know, because uh, I think, you know, um, the HK uh, white paper, as you said, it introduces a new system to basically fund any open source initiative through a mechanism that does not require intellectual property and that incentivizes its uh, participants and its community to engage in this, in this research process where basically each part does not have like, they, they do not have to have a common uh, thing, common, I mean, they don't have to, they can be counterparts, they can have no relation between each other, but they can still engage in something that makes sense in a common goal to make open source research. So as you said, it, this can be applied to any industry. Uh, the reason HK is um, focused on the medical research is because I think this is where the intellectual property has the more important role and the most important impact. And this is where uh, we can have the more impact, you know, to open science, because right now we know with the journals, with the economy of um, the world economy and of uh, intellectual property, uh, there is a lot to do. So let's talk about that. Let's before we get into how Etica works and what the user interface is and how can somebody come in and, and leverage the actual platform. Let's take a step back and talk about um, the mission. So what is your from your perspective, what is the issue with intellectual property as it relates to, in your case, biomedical sciences? What is it that you're trying to solve for by building Etica? Yeah, um, I mean, I think this is mainly twofold. Uh, I think there are a lot, a lot of issues, but there are two main issues, I believe. Uh, so the first one I think is about efficiency, you know, um, because I believe that open source is much more efficient than uh, any closed system. So the cost for society of not having something open source is that basically we could potentially find cures and treatments much faster but we do not because the current system is in, is not efficient. So this is, I think, the, the first, uh, you know, the first main issue is this question of efficiency. And the second issue uh, is, yeah, I mean, this is obvious, you know, when, when we, we see the researchers that have to pay in order to uh, publish something that they have made research for, this is absolutely crazy, you know, when I, discover the system where basically when a researcher after the researcher has done a lot of research and the researcher wants to share this research with the world not only they are not paid for it but they have to pay and like we're talking about thousands of dollars of fees just to publish you know so i think this is absolutely crazy and with hk you know basically it's completely opposite so when a researcher finds something they can go on the blockchain they can post it and they can make a proposal. And then within weeks, if the proposal is accepted, they're going to be funded for the idea and for the contribution to society. So this is a completely new vision of uh, how to make research. I see. That's very interesting. So I, I would, to go back, as you touched upon a few things, I would push back slightly on the notion of open source necessarily being more efficient. I think it's selectively, just like its counterpart. It's selectively, it's efficient where it is, and it's it, it, and it's not efficient where it's not. So I agree with you that having something more open source gives rise to more efficient innovation or more innovation, more opportunity for innovation because you have ideas colliding and clashing. There's a higher level of entropy within the system. As it relates to necessarily pushing things forward, the, 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 the flip side of that is that there's a lot more noise that exists. And so in a system that is fully open or with a lot of participants, not fully open, but a lot of participants in it, sometimes ideas can get lost just because of the sheer volume of interactions and collisions and ideas that come forth in such a system. So well, I agree. I think there are certain there there are pros to the more closed system, but the problem that I see is that it's the only option currently, right? That that's the issue for me. I think you should be able to pick and choose the beneficial points of either system, um, but there should be that opportunity there. Yeah, for sure. I think you know the way this is going to evolve 
is more like a parallel system, you know, that offer an alternative to people that want to engage in open source research. And uh, to answer your question about um, the issue, you know, of kind of a focus, you know, because you say if there are too many proposals, if there are too many things shared, then it can lo lo lose focus. I, I think uh, the the way the edge card blockchain is going to evolve is that uh, there, there are going to be a lot of debates around proposals because right now, when someone you know wants to publish in a journal, what happens is that the journal is going to employ few kind of experts, you know. So so basically the the paper is going to be analyzed by two or three experts that are going to review the research. But with edge guys, this is going to be completely different because since everything is open, it means that when there will be uh, a proposal submitted on the network, then there will be um, communities waiting for proposals. So let's take an example. Let's say, you know, uh, this there is a community about a specific cancer and someone submits a proposal to this specific disease, okay, to cancer. So what will happen is once the researcher publish into the cancer disease, then there will be a lot of communities, a lot of websites that are waiting for proposals about this specific disease. And there will be debates from these communities around the proposals that are coming. And since these communities will be up to date to the cutting edge technology, to the cutting edge research, they will not develop kind of expertise to analyze proposals and to identify what is very revolutionary, what is just an upgrade and allocate the resources depending on that. So I think once you open, if you have a good organization on top of the openness, I think this can lead to more efficiency. I absolutely agree with you. I think one of the biggest things that holds back science as an industry and also the implementation um, in society is the lack of scientific literacy. And that is a direct product or a partial direct product of the abstraction of science away from everyday, everybody's day to day and the siloing of it, right? So even within the scientific community, it's sometimes difficult to get your hands on or to become exposed to um, foundational research, right? Or at least the data that's, that, that's, that, that, that underlies that particular research. And that inherently is a lack of, or fosters a lack of understanding. I completely agree with you. Opening up the scientific paradigm um, in a variety of different ways, leveraging tech like Etika uh, DAOs as an orientation or a coordination um, tool for the community, as well as other tooling, is what I think will bring back the capacity for people to have these engaged and well-informed decisions, or make have these engaged and well-informed discussion that leads to better outcomes um, of whether it be therapies or tech or innovation. Completely agree with you with that. Yeah. So, in terms of um, Etika itself, let's walk me through the process. So. I'm yeah. a researcher. I want to leverage the tooling of the, the Etika blockchain to help support my ideas, my endeavors, my research protocol. Walk me through it. How do I do this? Yeah. So the way it works, you know, if you, if, let's take an example, a concrete example. So let's say, you know, you are a researcher, you just made the research. So you have a paper to publish and you made the research about, um, let, let's say lung cancer, you know, so You've just made your research, now you want to be funded. Okay, so the way it works is that you go on any platform that is connected to the HK blockchain. So since HK is a blockchain, there could be thousands and much more websites connected to the HK blockchain. So you can go on any um, website that is connected to the blockchain, and then you can publish your proposal on the network. Once you have published your proposal on the network, there is a voting system by the token holders of the, of, the, of the blockchain that can basically choose to accept or reject your proposal. And depending on the outcome of the vote, five weeks later, you get funded. So as a researcher, the, how you expand with the edge card blockchain is like you can make very often proposals, you know, because currently how funding works is more based on long-term processes, you know, because <clears throat> we are talking about years and, and sometimes several years, you know, for the funding process. 
if you have a grant, a grant system, the grant is going to you're going to take it, you know, maybe every couple of years. So you take the grant, then you are funded for some years, and then you come back to, to get it, you know. But with HKR, this is a much short term, short process, and this allows to share research much much more frequently. So as a researcher, every time you know you find something that is interesting for the community, you can go on the blockchain, you post your paper, then there is a voting process that lasts about five weeks, and then five weeks later, you get funded for what you have contributed to, to the community. Interesting. So it's actually a little bit more like um, a retroactive funding opportunity, right? So as somebody who, who, in your example, I've done the research, I'm posting my article or the publication, and then I'm getting funded based off of people's interest in that proposal so it's more of a retroactive funding uh, system yes yes it's um it, it's not like a grant system where you get funded before you make the research it's more like you you have to have something already you know that is good for the community and for the research before you can get funded Interesting. So this now starts to fall into the realm of the quote unquote hyper certs or hyper certs equivalent, which is a, a slightly different ver variation of this idea of public retroactive public goods funding um, that is coming out of protocol labs. Interesting. So, okay. And in terms of the, the, the actual um, size of the funding or size, of, I guess in this case, the reward for contributing to scientific knowledge, um, I imagine that the more you, you, submit proposal the smaller the bounty or the smaller the amount or the smaller the, the financial value of that funding or that reward is or is that somewhat like how does that work within the system uh, can you repeat your, your question so if i come and i post my proposal yeah and i only post one proposal what's the total value or what's the value of the reward that i can that i can expect to receive yeah so what the protocol does, so first of all, uh, the protocol has its own currency. And so this currency is issued by the neutral protocol. And so what happens is that every week, there is a fixed amount of this currency, which is named uh, HK, ETI. So this, um, this currency is issued by the, by the protocol every week. So there is a fixed amount issued by the protocol. And what happens is that anyone can submit proposals to get a part of this reward of this weekly of this uh, weekly reward every week so um what would happen with time is that it will even i think it will like uh, there will be proposals submitted every week but not like all the proposals the same week so what happens is when proposals are submitted they take a share of this um, reward I see. So it's based off of the 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 two percent emission, uh, or the emission schedule uh, of the token. Okay. Yeah. Well, that so that that introduces interesting uh, uh, parameters here, right? Because now we're we're delving into DeFi based or decentralized finance based funding of or, or alternative funding of research, um, and I would argue that most forms of even in DeFi, most forms of funding coming in are not so much leveraging DeFi. Um, and I hope to see that more going forward. Um, but okay. So in terms of the, the, the value of the, is it, is it, is the emission, is it always based off of the emission or is it based off of also the value of the token? So as an example here, if I get 1% of the emissions and the token is $1, will I still get 1% of the emissions if the token is one cent. Oh uh, yeah, I mean the the token is completely. I mean there is no link between. Uh, there is no technical link between like uh, it's not there is no like a stable coin you know. So uh, the protocol has its own currency, and then it's like with Bitcoin and Monero. It means that the market you know uh, will establish the, the price of this uh, of this currency you know. And I believe this will be based on the research that is done within the protocol. But let's say, you know, uh, so you, there is a research done and you get like 10 ETI. 
So this 10 ETI, maybe in 2023, this 10 ETI will be like worth $1. And potentially um, in 2030 or after, you know, it will be worth much, much more, you know. So when you get the reward, it's a reward of this currency. And then there is a, a market, you know, this is a currency that will be traded on exchanges. So there will be a price of this currency. And then the researcher, once they receive the currency, they can decide to hold it or they can decide to, to sell it back to, to finance anything they, they need to finance. And uh, yeah, this is the way it works. Interesting. And so uh, this opens up, uh, you know, we're going to uh, deviate a little bit away from the scientific perspective and into the economics. And I think mm -hmm. this is important as it relates to, to decentralized science as well. What is fueling the value of the token? So if you don't have intellectual property, mm -hmm. um, where is the value coming from to support that kind of economy? Yeah, um, I think, you know, this comes down to um, the blockchain ecosystem because I believe that the blockchain technology, there was a huge excitement, you know, at the beginning of blockchain. But then I think people have, do, did not understand what blockchain should be used for and what it will mean for our civilization. So I believe that blockchain is necessary and very useful to solve civilization issues. So we have Bitcoin you know, and Monero that are solving the problem of um, money in, uh, issuance and creating a new system where we do not need central entities like central banks to create money. So I think this is a huge problem that our civilization had and that blockchain will resolve. Then I think the second very important issue of our civilization that blockchain can help with is this question of how we can make open source research without intellectual property. And for this, uh, this is why the blockchain, uh, the HK blockchain was created. And I think that having such, you know, an impact on society, this will, this is what will bring the value, you know, the same way Bitcoin and Monero will have value in the future because they are, they are cryptocurrencies that solve a civilization issue. I think HK will have the same kind of impact. And this is what will bring value on the, on the long term. Well, I will say, I will say this, um, mm -hmm. you know, Bitcoin's value is it's, finite scarcity. Monero's, Monero's value is its privacy. Mm -hmm. Etika's value as it relates to intellectual property is, or the lack there, or the funding of science is, is valuable to an extent, but it's not something that, so like that's not what's going to inject value into the token, right? That's one use case of it. And arguably, because it is a blockchain, anybody can start to develop um, utility for it right like anybody can develop dApps on it that are not related necessarily to the scientific endeavor um but my only inch like my only uh one hiccup or caveat that i might see here is that you you may not have sufficient value present to warrant people wanting to leverage it for funding or for retroactive funding right because like i said if i get 23 cents back because the value of the token is so low then it's not worth me using my proposals there, right? There has to be a reason why somebody outside of just publishing would value that token. Oh, I mean, this is this is the same issue, you know, that Bitcoin had, you know, in early days. Right. That the question, you know, of um, because you know, on, on the early days, someone could have argued that Bitcoin could never succeed because uh, since the hash rate, you know, is very low at the beginning then anyone, you know, any entity that identified Bitcoin in its early days will have enough hash rate to basically end Bitcoin, you know. But um, I, I think, you know, with, with time, you know, uh, the first, what, what, what we have seen with Edgka is that first we, we, we had a, a community of miners that, that, that came and identified Edgka. And now Edgka is going, to, is, it, it, it is starting, you know, to, to be traded on exchanges and um, with an increasing activity. So I think the, the, there will be, you know, early people that will identify the technology and that will give it its value in the early days. And these people know, 
or taking more risk because they are entering uh, in early days the same way that the, pe the people that entered into Bitcoin in 2009, 2009, 2020 and 2011, they took more risk you know, to enter a new protocol and in early days. But with time, I think um, we see more adoption and also the um, participants of the network would change of nature, you know, because in early days of uh, Bitcoin, the people that were mining Bitcoin, it was uh, uh, just, you know, small computers, small individuals, but with time it has changed and it has professionalized itself and companies started to, to use it. So basically, I, I think potentially in five to 10 years, uh, some companies will use Edgeka as a funding mechanism because this is not because it is an open source system that uh, companies cannot use it. You know, this is a new way to organize research and it is like a framework for research. And in the future, this could even fund um, companies. So the, the question of the amount of, um, of um, like how, how the reward can fund the research uh, uh, the, 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 there is a website, uh, Edge Economics, where basically uh, we, we've made kind of simulations of how much research we could fund with uh, HKI, you know, because once we, something important we didn't say here, that HKI also, you know, has this, this aspect of uh, scarcity, because you, you mentioned that what gives value to Bitcoin is its scarcity. But like Etika will also have scarcity because once we reach 21 million Etika in 10 years, because it will take 10 years to reach uh, 21 million Etika, and then there will be a fixed inflation of about 1% per year, and this is this inflation that will reward research. So Etika will be also extremely scarce. People can use it as a store of value, but in addition to the store of value, they can use Etika to. Um, oriented research and to leverage, you know, the research, the open source research. Awesome. That's good. And I did notice that you had different links on the website and I highly encourage everybody to go check out the website, um, detailing different aspects. Um, I didn't know that the economics one was specifically for a stimulation run in terms of how that works. Um, that's really cool. In terms of the community, has there been, so are there active uh, research proposals that have been submitted to the blockchain? Um, As, yeah. When it comes to the research, you know, we are still uh, very, very early. So I think the, the first year, you know, has been a focus on the blockchain, you know, just getting the blockchain started uh, with the world ecosystem, you know, um, which is already, you know, something very, very hard and, and harsh, but I, I think on this step, you know, this is a huge step that HK has done, you know, right now the, the hash rate, everything has increased and we have more and more people that are joining uh, the blockchain. And right now we are just about, you know, to get started when it comes to the actual research, you know, because something also important to mention is that the, when it comes to the issuance of HK, so the first year it was 90% to the mining reward and 10% to the research. So yes, something that should be underlined is that there are basically three ways to get Etika right now. Is first to mine it because this is a cryptocurrency that can be mined the same way a Bitcoin and Monero can be mined. So this is very, you know, like decentralized, no entity and anybody can basically uh, plug a computer and mine some edge cards. And then uh, is to publish some research on the network and uh, the researchers can publish, you know, because let's say you are a miner or someone who has hardware, yes, you can mine each car, but if you are a researcher, you can earn each car, the same each car by publishing your research and making, and making it open source. And then the other way is to vote on proposals when people vote on the proposals there was a world system um, that allows you know to reward also the people that voted on proposals and the last way you know is to buy uh, the cryptocurrency on exchanges so these are the the main ways to uh, to get hk interesting so it's a proof of work system but i i, I forgot why I, I came back to this one because you 
can you repeat your, your question? Uh, I actually forgot what my original question was. It was around. I mean, essentially, we were going around the the value of the of the of the blockchain and the and the proposals moving. Oh no, sorry, it was the um. Uh, oh, I lost it. I lost the reason. Okay, no, no problem. No problem. It, it's fine. We can move yeah. forward. Oh no, my question. Sorry, my question to you was: Has there been? Have there already been scientific proposals submitted to the chain? And you said oh, that yeah. no, currently you're. It's in early stages, and you're working like. Right now, the miners get the lump sum of the emissions, but obviously, as liquidity starts to yeah, 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 that's uh, it, that's it. Yes. right, yes, it's it. yes. So yes, so um, so the first year there is ninety percent that goes to the mining reward and ten percent to the research process. The second year there is eighty percent that goes to the mining reward and twenty percent to the research, and the third year is the seventy percent, thirty percent until the fifth year so the, the fifth year it will be 50 percent to mining rewards and 50 percent to the research and after the, the the fifth year until the 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 10th year when we reach 21 million each car then there will it's like 50 percent for mining and 50 percent for research so with time you know the incentive to um to publish research on each car is going to increase uh because right now uh, it's about um, it's about eight thousand HK every week to reward research, and um, next year this will increase, you know, to about twelve thousand, and yeah, until until we reach twenty one million HKs, and then there will be a fixed inflation of one percent per year. And that total one percent will go, or I guess maybe ninety percent of that one percent it'll flip. Ninety percent of that one percent will go to research whereas 10 goes to miners or what's that split once we hit that 20 then, million? then the the reward to miners completely stops and okay. all the all the reward completely goes to research oh so you essentially after 21 million you switch to a different consensus mechanism right no, no longer, yeah. it's still mining yeah yeah but because one, the, there there are two cryptocurrencies on the hk blockchain Okay. So there is one which is HEI. This is a cryptocurrency that uh, endorses the protocol and reward researchers. Right. And the second cryptocurrency is called EGAS. And so this cryptocurrency um, is um, what secures the blockchain. So the two cryptocurrency can be mined, but after we reach 21 million HEIs, HK will, will stop uh, uh, the mining process. And the only way to, to get HK will be to publish researchers on the protocol or to vote on other pro on other proposals and when it comes to um when it comes to um what you are saying about what happens is that then the cryptocurrency that keeps going uh, mining is uh, egas so uh when hk stopped to be mined is it doesn't change the consensus mechanism because this is handled by egas okay i see interesting okay uh but it is always so well then what gets emitted so the mining emits e-gas what emits the FT, FTI now this is, may be a naive question i'm not a i'm not a blockchain specialist no no no, no. Is... i mean i mean uh, uh, i mean this this kind of questions are the ones that are the more like useful, you know, for people listening, I think. And so don't hesitate, you know, to ask any question you have. So um, um, there are two cryptocurrencies. So there is ETI and there is EGAS. So they are, comp they are separate cryptocurrencies and each of them can be mined. So let's say if you want to mine ETI, ETI you have to use a specific miner to mine it. And if you want to, to mine EGAS, you have to use another one. And so um, to answer your question is when um, um, if in the future it's possible you not know, to stop the mining process on ETI without impacting what happens on EGAS, you know, because they are separate cryptocurrencies, right. even if they are on the same blockchain. Right. I understand. Okay. I get that. Okay. That's really good. That's very interesting. So in terms of uh, 
because it isn't open source and nobody's really directing the platform, my usual follow-up question is what's the roadmap? But maybe I can tweak it a little bit in terms of what does the community seem to be pushing forward? Are there any proposals? Are there updates, are there updates proposals like EIPs that have been coming out of the community in terms of what is the orientation that Etika should take? Yeah. Um... Something very interesting you know, is that since Etika has a very unique and innovative voting process to, uh, you know, to, to vote on proposals, on open source medical research proposals, we can use this system to also organize how the blockchain evolves. So right now what happens is that there is a specific, like what we call a struct uh, that is called Etika. And so on the blockchain, there is a kind of, a a place where people can post exactly what you, you said, you know, kind of um, EIPs, so improvement proposals to improve the blockchain. And then uh, the, the same system that is used to vote on proposals or medical proposals can be used to vote on such proposals to um, improve the blockchain. So this is the way, you know, this is going to evolve is that when someone wants to change something on the blockchain, the process, is to publish an OIP on the HK blockchain. Then the token holders, they can decide to accept or reject the proposal. And if the proposal is accepted, then the change will be implemented into the blockchain. So um, it's like, you know, Ethereum, um, it's as if um, Ethereum had a kind of um, a, a voting process that allows the token holders to, to choose the changes, you know. Because uh, HK is a fork of Ethereum Classic, but it is a proof of work cryptocurrency. And, you know, on Ethereum, we have seen that how things evolved, that there is this kind of central entity that decides what happens on the blockchain. But this is not how HK will evolve. Uh, it is always going to be the community that will decide what happens on HK blockchain. That was going to be my follow up question, actually. Um, specific to that. So Ethereum has the Ethereum foundation that essentially comes in and, you know, tweaks and, and pushes Shanghai update and all these kind of things. There's no equivalent in Etika. Is that correct? Yeah, there is no equivalent to Etika. Yeah. Okay. You know, um, uh, yeah. I mean, right now, the way it evolves, you know, it's fully community driven. Uh, there is no entity behind it. Um, and uh, up to now, you know, this is evolving, I think, you know, pretty, pretty well. And we are, I mean, the blockchain is um, getting stronger and stronger with, with time. And um, yeah, I think hopefully we will never have to have uh, this kind of uh, a system on the, on, the, on, on the ecosystem, you know. Very interesting. I think this is a very cool piece of tech. Um, I hope people start to utilize it. I look forward to the point where we hit that threshold where now, it's much more appealing for scientists to come and submit proposals than say necessarily the, the miners to come in. Miners will always be important. And I guess in theory, there is no actual threshold there, but I, I'm looking forward to the time when people start to leverage this. Um, so in terms of, and we, we talked about this a little bit previously and you gave us your perspective, but if I'm gonna ask you pointedly, what is your definition of success for Etika? Yeah. Um... I, I would say, you know, the day when a researcher or a, a community of researchers, when they can benefit from open source research from other researchers, and when, when they find something, you know, they basically just have to connect to the blockchain, submit their proposals, and within a couple of weeks, you know, being rewarded by the blockchain, I think this is, uh, this is the main goal, you know, is to, to, to completely change the flow of research and um, to completely also accelerate the pace of research that we have right, right now. Uh, and I, I think, you know, that if we open research, because let's take the example, for instance, of uh, AI, you know, some experts, you know, a few years ago, they had a lot of uh, predictions how much time it would take for AI to evolve towards, let's say, AGI and, you know. And what happened is that in the last couple months, we have seen the space evolving so, so fast. And this has, this has absolutely shocked the world. And the reason why I believe is because 
the way the AI industry has organized itself, you know, we see that people are constantly sharing papers, open source papers. And I think this is what is driving the research in the background. And this is the main reason why this field is evolving so fast, you know, because if it was a closed system like we have in the medical industry, and if it was driven mainly by intellectual property, where you have private companies working on their own, own thing and without sharing anything, I think like the, the path of research when it comes to AI would be uh, 10, if not 100 times slower, you know. So the idea you know, is to create an incentive system that will enable people to have the, canc the same kind of um, momentum when it comes to medical research. Because right now, medical research, you know, they're, uh, I mean, there are not enough people working on this, you know, in an open source way. For instance, you know, back in 2018 also, I discovered a project that was called Open Source Malaria. Uh, it was one of the first open source projects, you know, for medical research that tries to uh, create um, a treatment for malaria, but to make it open source. And when I was uh, in, in the project and all of this, like the, the, there was, the, let's say like a dozen researchers, you know, and they were not very active. Why? Because they did not have any incentive to take part in such a research process. But with HK in the future, we can have a system where uh, any decentralized organization, any GAO, any uh, independent researcher can basically plug into the system, submit their proposals and get re financially rewarded within a couple of weeks. And when people will start to share their research and what they found, I think this is what will completely accelerate the pace of research. Amazing. So yeah, I mean, the, the main goal, I, I hope, you know, my, in my absolutely dream is that HK will find a cure for something as big as cancer in you know, one day. That is a lofty dream, um, but I, I don't see why not. At least as in terms of being a part of the tech stack that helped fuel the discovery of that of that cure, I, I don't see why that wouldn't be the case. Um, I, I envision a world, especially a decentralized science world, where a lot of these, a lot of entities or DAOs or communities leverage modularly all this tech that is coming out and pieces piece them together. People have heard me say this, Voltron. Voltron then connect them together to, to yield the kind of outcome, the kind of innovation that we're, we're all kind of hoping to see. Um, and so with that, that kind of last piece, um, as we reach the top of the hour, um, how can the wider community help support Etika? Well, I mean, uh, right now, HK, you know, is at the very you know, beginning stage. And what I think, you know, what we need for, for the, for the world DSI ecosystem for the world uh, blockchain ecosystem, you know, um, is yeah something I didn't mention, you know, is that um, any like JO, any organization can use HK for its own interest, for its own benefit, you know, because right now I believe that the way DSI is organizing itself, um, the, the, like I think the, the question of uh, intellectual property is central because if we keep intellectual property and we do not make research open source, I don't believe the impact of a DSI will be as big as it should be, you know. I think the, the main point is to open research. And when it comes to open research, then the main question is how to finance it. And th this is what the HK system is built for, you know, it's, it can basically finance the whole DSI ecosystem, you know. So um, I think there will be some GAOs that will dive into what we are doing. They will identify the opportunity and they will start, you know, to use it, you know, and um, this is what we, we hope and what will happen, you know, that some GAOs will basically, you know, understand the potential that HK can have for, for them and then for the world ecosystem and to, to start, you know, publishing into this blockchain and then uh, having more and more research uh, shared in uh, the HK blockchain. So yeah, if, if there is any like uh, GAO, any independent researcher that wants to publish on HK, just know that uh, the blockchain is completely open. Uh, there is a Discord, there is, a, uh, there is um, also a Telegram. I mean, the community is very active and the community will be very you know, glad to be able you know, to reward that research. 
and uh, to yeah to initiate you know this kind of momentum fantastic so as kevin said check out etica um follow them on twitter uh join their discord join their telegram um join the community support whether you're a builder a DAO, a community this is a blockchain this is not a protocol this is a blockchain, which means that it is a modular technology that you can leverage for your means, whether it be funding or other sources um, or other um, initiatives. Um, so it's, it's much more wide reaching and, and, and uh, flexible than we're seeing other in other more standalone concentrated DSI projects. Um, so please do check them out. Kevin, um, for yourself, uh, we'd love to be able to showcase more of Etica. So as, as I mentioned at the beginning of this, uh, part of this uh, Twitter spaces, we've recently announced the beginning of what we are calling the DSI, the World of DSI conference series. The first one is taking place in Belgrade. And the initiative behind that is to showcase some of the tech or as much of the tech as possible that exists in decentralized science that can help push forward this concept of open, accessible, transparent, reproducible science. So Kevin, you are more than welcome to sign up as a speaker um, or submit any information, whether it be a poster, um, a demo of Etica, so we can start sharing this with the wider scientific community, those that are not already within the Web3 d side space, um, and show them that there's a lot of cool tech out here that, that, that they can use um, and to bring them on board. So you're more than welcome to, to, to be a part of this if you're interested. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I will uh, definitely you know, look into this invitation. You know, it will be a great pleasure. You know. Awesome. Perfect. So I will, I will actually help you. I'll send, send over uh, any documentation that, that we have on hand for that. So without further ado, guys, this has been a great conversation. Kevin, thank you very much for coming on and, and talking to us about Etica. I think it's a fantastic dream. It's one that addresses a sorely underrated perspective in DSI in terms of how do you fund basic research, not clinical stage research, not therapies, um, but actual basic research, um, whether it be proactively or retroactively. And so thank you very much for that. Um, are there any closing statements you want to make before we head off? No, I mean, uh, thank you very much for, you know, this, um, for this um, uh, welcoming. And, you know, I think, uh, you know, if, if someone has any question, I would be glad not to answer. But uh, yeah, I really, you know, appreciated this exchange with you. And yeah, I'm, I'm looking you know, forward to the future of DSI and to see how this will evolve. Because I, I believe that uh, right now this is still, you know, uh, and of, um, I mean, I don't think the uh, ecosystem, you know, is recognized as much as it's sold right now. So I'm uh, looking forward to the future to see how it evolves. Oh, we have so much room to grow. I completely agree with you. I'm excited to see what the next two, three, four, five, ten, sixteen 10, 16 years, um, arbitrary numbers, uh, yields in terms of how DSI is going to explode. I think it is really going to be a Cambrian explosion, similar to the open source, open source software movement. Um, so with that being said, guys, thank you for tuning in, um, for those who are here and, you know, actively live and those who will be listening into, in, into the, uh, recording on YouTube and the other platforms with which you post them on. Thanks for tuning in. Do reach out to Kevin, reach out to Etika, join them, support them, support all of these side projects. Make sure you go and vote for, or go and donate to the Gitcoin DSI round that is currently taking place. Um, a lot of amazing projects that are up there looking to push forward this whole notion of open, accessible science. Um, and so with that, thank you for tuning in. We'll see you guys next week for our next episode of DSI Rising. Have a great weekend, Kevin. You have a great weekend. And yeah, we'll be in touch. See you later, guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye.